Welcome to the Physique Development Muscle Series. In this special series, we're breaking down the science and art of training each muscle group. Each episode is dedicated to a specific muscle, providing you with expert insight into its function, dispelling common training misconceptions, and highlighting our go-to exercises that deliver results. We'll also share key execution cues to help you perfect your technique and maximize your gains. Get ready to elevate your training game and achieve your fitness goals like never before. Let's dive into lats. Before we get into today's interview, let's give a warm welcome to my friend, Eugene Teo. Eugene is a former bodybuilder turned movement enthusiast and has spent over a decade in the industry of training, coaching, and helping those around him and around the world. He is a problem solver through and through and has worked with athletes across dozens of different sports, along with countless everyday athletes in the pursuit of improving their health and overall wellness. Eugene is a leader within the health and fitness industry and is known for his unique teaching style and breaking down complex topics into applicable, easy to understand concepts. And he did a lot of that in today's episode. He has lectured in over 50 cities across the world, educating coaches and trainers, health professionals and athletes on all things training, biomechanics and exercise execution. All of this to say, he makes the perfect guest to break down our next muscle group, lats and the upper back. Eugene, I am very grateful to have your time and to have you on the podcast today. My first question for us digging into lat training or back training in general is going to be publicly, what do you believe to be the most misunderstood aspect of back training? Oh, shit. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, it depends on what kind of lens you're looking at this from. So misunderstood, it could be this fear of spinal flexion um, or maybe just an avoidance or just not training that at all. And people think spinal flexion in terms of like rounding the back forwards. Yes, that's one thing that people aren't really doing enough of, but also lateral flexion, rotation, twisting, every kind of motion that you can take your spine through um, beyond just being stuck in one rigid locked in position is probably going to be beneficial because we have movement capacity that we should have movement capacity to be able to move our spine, but we don't do that much in training, especially like physique oriented training. Um, there's a big, I'm surprised that it still exists, this fear and demonization of moving your spine in any way and having any dynamic motion in exercise. Um, I think a lot of people have been so hyper-focused on trying to find the perfect setup and form where everything is just locked and dialed in perfectly where only the one target muscle of this iliac lat fiber or this costal pec or whatever it is is just being loaded up beautifully, which, you know, I love that. That's fucking cool. But in the pursuit of that, we've also lost this ability to just explore movement optimization from a more holistic perspective, although I hate that fucking word holistic. <laughs> it's, it's more just about saying, like, your body's meant to move. And, you know, your brand is physique development. And people think of that as like, oh, just build the muscles. Well, you want to develop every aspect of your physique to be a capable human. Part of being able to build bigger muscles is making sure that your body can support that. And how well can your body really support the growth of new tissue and the long-term development of your physique if you can barely twist your spine to wipe your own ass? And those are the things that I think people are missing with training. I think we've gotten really, really, really good at understanding the nuance on how to set things up perfectly um, and put tension on the right target area. Um, but it's those bigger pictures that we've sort of just completely lost sight of, especially in this world of like pure physique development and bodybuilding. I can agree. And so if someone was wanting to incorporate more spinal flexion into their training, how would you go or how would you advise someone to incorporate that more? Yeah. Um, a lot of different strategies to, in yeah, let me think. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different strategies when it comes to exploring more movement at the spine. You can go straight down the route of something like a Jefferson curl. We start programming that in and say, okay, let's just start doing a Jefferson curl in your training in general um, as a primary exercise of some sort. But it can just be allowing it to start to happen in some of your more regular exercises like a cable row or a machine or whatever, just letting your body bend a little bit further. It could just be exploring it as part of a movement prep or a warm-up. 
you know, that's a big one. Like I love doing for just about every single one of my programs now, there's a workouts that I do is I'll spend the first five, 10 minutes just doing something that's low load, but more variable and dynamic and exploratory in movement where I'm doing more rotation or I'm doing more twisting or I'm doing more just bending in different planes, um, more direct um, abdominal training um, in all planes of motion. So not just sagittal front forwards, flexing the spine like abs, but also the side bending, oblique work. Um, but don't be complex at all. I just say just, you know, you don't need much. It's just one exercise, five, 10 minutes. Um, and just like anything else, you gradually expose. You start where you can, just slowly explore more and more movement over time. And, you know, I'm sure you've seen, you can get super strong on this stuff. Although no one really cares about strength with anyway. It's more <laughs> just about capacity. Just build that and just go there. Is this something that you've always focused on within your back training or is this something that you have adopted more recently? Um, yeah, it's been, it's been there since, you know, my very early days of bodybuilding. So like 10, 15 years ago, um, I've always been very big on moving the body as much as you can and exploring as many different patterns as you can. Um, I explain it a lot better now and I understand it a lot better now, 100%. And that's just from, you know, I'm sure you understand pure bodybuilding a lot better now just from having done it for so, so long. Um, but it was also something that always just made sense to me is as a bodybuilder, people think, oh, when I was coming up in the industry, I was just like pure bodybuilding. That wasn't my jam. Like my first introduction to training was more around things like gymnastics and calisthenics um, and I was always very much intrigued and influenced by a lot of other modalities, even like something like weightlifting. And um, even though I'm not a weightlifter whatsoever, I barely do any Olympic weightlifting. Um, but seeing other styles of training, seeing how they can excel, um, and it just looked fucking cool. Um, and there's always this component of movement capacity that was integrated in just about every other athletic endeavor that you see out there, apart from physique development apart from bodybuilding, it never made sense to me as to why that was the case. And I never wanted to be someone who could add another 10 kilos of muscle, but it took away from my body. Not from an aesthetic standpoint, but from just like a, yeah, can I get up off the couch more easily? Am I more able physically to be able to provide for those around me and help and just be stronger and um, more able? And that wasn't always the case. I see. So is there anything from times past within your own training or things that you would teach within back training that you look back now and would say, oh, that's not, that's not as right as I thought it was, or you've completely changed your opinion on? Yeah, um, definitely. Always, always going to be things. I was like, yeah, that, that was fucking dumb. <laughs> um, a lot of it is more about the reprioritization and how much emphasis I'd place on things. Like I just said to you then with like spinal flexion or the whole just moving your spine around and just letting your body explore, moving in general, I was a lot heavier on how I would emphasize that in training. Whereas now I'm like, you know, five, 10 minutes. Um, if you want to do more, 100% do more. Um, but it's probably for most people not going to be the biggest bang for your buck. Like if you came to me and said, Eugene, I want to put on 10 kilos of muscle mass as fast as I can. I'll give you five, 10 minutes in a workout of this kind of movement exploration stuff. Um, whereas five, maybe more, 10 years ago, I would have been like, we should make this a really high priority. Um, almost to the point of um, fear mongering saying, oh, because you can't do this, you're all kinds of fucked up. You know, and I say, like, yeah, that's probably taking things too far, um, which is kind of th um, how anything works when you learn something. You learn something, you're like, oh, this is the fucking best thing ever. And you want to just share it and you go fucking hard on it. And then you realize, oh, I've probably drunk the Kool-Aid a little bit too much. I've got to just wind it back a little bit and, and reassess how important it really is. Because like most things, I think just about everything, um, the, the secret sauce, the best thing lies somewhere in the middle. It's not negligent. It's not completely like pro it. It's something in between that's a bit more measured and say, okay, how can we get the most out of this? Um, so that's a big one. Um, another big one is um, I used to be humongously pro on sensation-based training hmm. where it'd be like, yeah, if something feels like you're getting a really strong contraction um, and maybe even a pump from it, then it must be really good. Um, I still think pump is very, very underrated and it's been, it's gone the other direction where everyone's saying pump is not necessary for gains whatsoever. You don't need to get a pump. It's a waste of fucking time. It's not indicative of muscular tension in the muscle. Like, well, that's not the fucking point though, is it? it doesn't mean you should discard it. It's still a very, very good indicator of where things are going and how practical an exercise might be for you. Um, it's not going to measure exactly, yeah, you're going to 
create more muscle mass from the one exercise over another, but it's still a useful proxy. Um, but yeah, I was very good on sensation specifically, saying, oh, if this muscle gets a really strong heart contraction, like if you're doing a lying leg curl, you're going to feel a lot more in your hamstrings most of the time than you would have an RDL. And I'll say that's because it's a really good exercise to be doing all the time. Um, and it's just simply not the case. Uh, like what we know now and what I, I've learned since then is that, yeah, we're going to get sensation in different areas just based on length and relationship and how your body just perceives pain or sensation in general. It's not necessarily indicative of the validity or the poor validity of an exercise as well. Um, but I use a lot of sensation-based stuff still in my training, but I'll justify it in different ways or I talk about it a lot more from a perspective of um, improving the sensory map of from for your brain because like muscle is a sensory organ your skin is a sensory organ and you need to have some kind of perceptive awareness of like where is your body in space where is your muscle do you have some kind of awareness of that if you don't then how are you going to be able to productively do much work for it you can still place tension on the muscle like even just because i don't feel my back on a deadlift doesn't mean my back's not working on a deadlift um but having some kind of sensory awareness of it is probably going to be helpful long term i agree and with both of those situations, can you recall the moment where you realized that you maybe taken both of those things too far, where you were presented with a, a con or a downfall of going too deep into the spinal flexion or too deep into this uh, sensory training? Was there any moment that you can recall that would was kind of that moment of, okay, I need to pull the reins back a little bit? Yeah. Um, so sensory training, 100%. Um, Coach Kassam, um uh, Kasim Hansen, he was a big influence on that um, because he and I, like we were both, well, we still like we were doing a lot of workshops around the similar kind of times um, and he just started calling me out big time. <laughs> <laughs> um, got pretty fucking aggressive at some point. So I was like, this is, this is not cool, man. Like I've never met you and, and you have a lot of negative shit to say about me that is based on your, uh, on a, um, something we'd never discussed yeah <laughs> um so i reached out to him and said hey man look if you've got a problem um or you don't like what i teach or you don't like the way that i'm explaining things uh let me know but don't go around just spreading this stuff about me that may or may not be true but it's at least let it be based on some kind of fact having discussed with me um so he was very um very generous in spending some time took, chatting with me and helping me understand this a little bit and i was like you know what that makes a lot of sense and i'm going to just change my perspective on that and how I present that information because he was right simple simply put um as far as spinal flexion stuff goes or like the movement optimization kind of thing um there was never a, a strict moment where I was like oh this is too far it was more just an evolution and just trying to see okay what's actually getting people the best results um what does the industry also need to hear more of as well where I think at the time when I was really 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 heavily pro on it the industry needed to hear a lot more about it. And that's kind of what fueled the fire for me to be talking and emphasizing a lot more in my training um, and trying to be like that influencer of that um, of that factoid. Um, and then I just started thinking, okay, people are taking this too far. It's kind of like, you know, all the biomechanics stuff in that now is an optimization of exercise selection and whatnot. I think it's going a little bit too far. Um, and I think that's why I think it's important to have the people ex um, realize that this is not the one thing that's going to get you all the results. It's a very important variable that you should focus on, um, but don't let it lose sight of all the other really important variables as well as part of a bigger picture. So with the overhype of biomechanics, which I can agree with you, it's been taken to a place where it's like, if you don't do it this exact way, you cannot do anything and you're wrong and you're not going to grow any muscle tissue unless you line things up absolutely perfect with you speaking to people needing to hear a specific message, what is that message around back training at the moment? Um, mm. It can't be put into a soundbite. Yeah, it's probably <laughs> true. Because it, it, is, it, it is this marriage of optimizing your biomechanics, optimizing your setup, not discounting efforts, but also allowing your body to, to lose some of the optimal biomechanics and understand all the things that play into it. Because part of being able to apply appropriate effort should also, by default, encapsulate you losing optimal biomechanics at some point and you using things like momentum 
using things like cheating and changing your body position throughout the exercise to put you into a slightly better mechanical advantage as you fatigue. Like doing like when someone someone does like say a um, a lap pull down and they as they fatigue they just start to lean back a bit more and maybe maybe even swing a little bit more vein just at least just they change body position. And it's like oh yeah you've taken this iliac fiber out of its ideal line of pull. But why has your body done that? Probably because it's trying to use other muscles, which is not a bad thing because we're trying to achieve failure. We're trying to achieve a high effort stimulus. And part of that will demand that you take your body out of the ideal setup that was perfect for reps one to 10 when you were zero, uh, like 10 RIR. Um, when that changes, you want to let other muscle groups assist. It's kind of like getting... I guess, you know, to probably put this quite crudely and bastardize what's actually happening in the body. But let's imagine for a second that these divisions of your lats, the iliac, the thoracic, the lumbar, whatever, imagine they're all separate muscles, completely separate muscles, which they're not. But you're doing this optimized lat pull down for your iliac lats and you start to fail. So we can say, okay, your iliac lat is starting to fail. If you change body position ever so slightly, and the other areas can start to kick in a little bit more. Yes, they're still not in their most optimal leverage position to be pulling from, but they can assist some, which is the same as getting extra force reps out. It's the same as me coming in and spotting you and helping you for that iliac lat gets more stimulus. Um, again, that's a complete oversimplification of how the body actually works, but I think it sort of helps the point of like, if we're trying to get high effort, there also needs to be a degree of loss of perfect optimal biomechanics and that doesn't mean it's bad and this is part of what brings into the equation of movement optimization and knowing that your body is not fragile it's very anti-fragile not just robust but it will it will thrive and it will become better from being exposed to areas of weakness and areas of disadvantageous positions where that is a really important thing that people aren't doing enough of because they're trying to hyper-focus on, ah, terminate the set. You lost essential control. You lost you lost depth. You lost range. It's like, no, just fucking go there and push it. Um, and this is where like, yeah, it's not a soundbite. It's, it's a lot of things at play here that we've got to try to, um, to marry up together in an elegant way, um, which is very challenging to do. Um, but that's why like for my, for my own training personally, I try to incorporate everything into the, into like, a block or into a workout where it's not just this is a whole lat day or optimizing the lats only this is, might be um a back day or a lat day that includes a few different styles of very strict technique very loose technique more momentum based training more explosive based training more flexion based training more rigid training we've got to have it all low reps is best high reps is best. fruit is so it's good for terrible you, for you should you. lift heavy high reps carbs are way. needed Keto squats are bad for your squats are great you for should your squat ass to grass. Toes. it's fine it fits my macros for idiots. when there are so many mixed messages going around it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on but that's exactly where physique development one-on-one -on -one coaching comes in you might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life into consideration we want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. So with the, the structure to that training, if you were to build the perfect training session for you when it came to, to back training, how would you kind of lay out those exercises? Um, the exercises themselves, it's going to be nothing fancy at all like it's the same exercise everyone does it's going to be a pull down of some sort or some kind of vertical pull diagonal pulls horizontal pulls different kind of planes of motion use machines cables barbells dumbbells body, whatever you want um, but what i care about more is the principles of moving fast moving slow um moving in a very rigid fixed fashion like we're keeping things as stable as possible and having a lot of instability they're probably like the four well actually it's only two things it's it's speed and it's stability that you're playing with here. So there are some exercises I want where I want to have a high degree of stability, but I don't want to completely neglect exercises that have a low level of stability. Take a machine row, chest supported machine row versus a barbell row. Okay, we have two very different degrees of stability here. Um, a lot of biomechanists and inverted commas will say barbell is a waste of time. 
because you have to worry about your erectors and your legs fatiguing, it takes tension away from the target muscle. All the effort should be focused on the back. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's completely true. I'm not going to discount that either. Like I've said that. It makes fucking perfect sense. doesn't mean the barbell row is something that you should always avoid or that it doesn't have unique benefits that you simply cannot get from those chest support and machine row. More from an instability and be able to just control heavy weight. And that may not necessarily add significantly more muscle mass to your body in a discrete, isolated test where you're testing one against the other. But it's very, very, very important for your brain from an ability to control weight from a body awareness perspective um, and probably more of an integration perspective, which may or may not help with things like injury prevention long term, but definitely more from a just overall resilience standpoint. Um, and then the same thing with speed. Okay, like we want a, we have like, you know, some research does indicate now that there's probably going to be an ideal range of rep tempo um, where you want to have some control in the eccentric, some kind of like, um, some kind of slowness, but not super slow, not specifically slowness to the concentric. Um, but it doesn't mean that we, and that's for hypertrophy, but it doesn't mean that we should avoid very fast, explosive, almost plyometric based exercises as well. And that's something that I'll, that I'll incorporate a lot, where I'll intentionally do things that are very explosive for upper body. That's sort of like, you know, you, you might do a box jump or a depth jump um, or pogos for plyometrics for your lower body. There's not much that we specifically do for the upper body. And yeah, we're now looking at athletic development, not physique development, but it's all the same human organism. The benefits that you get from plyometric and speed-based training, explosive-based training for the lower body in the tendons and in the muscle tissue as well, we should be wanting those things for the upper body as well. Is it going to add 10 more kilos of muscle mass versus a slow, controlled, perfect hypertrophy exercise? Probably not. But is it an important component for the human organism that will then allow it to do more of the slow, controlled muscle building work? Absolutely. And the better we get at trying to build muscle, the more that we neglect that kind of stuff and that's where the gaps appear. So for my training, I'll always have something slow controlled, at least one exercise, if not more. I'll have something very fast, explosive, snappy and loose. I'll have something that's very, um, very stable, chest supported row, have something that's very um, unstable, which could just be a dumbbell row um, or something like that or a cable or a yes, cable row, which is a little bit more looseness involved. How much I emphasize on each one of those quadrants, I guess, of training will depend on what my specific emphasis is. If this is more of a hypertrophy block, I'll do maybe two or three movements that are based on slow and controlled stability. If I want a little bit less of that, it comes down to one and I do more explosive plyometric based stuff for the upper body or more loose training and more spinal flexion based work. Okay. I like that. Um, that leads me into a question of if we look at all the muscle groups, do you feel like back is the most dependent on machines to grow? Um, I wouldn't say it's the most dependent on machines, but it's probably where we have a lot more opportunities um, due to that length tension, tension relationship and due to the, the way that gravity works, where most free weight exercises for back, barring maybe a pullover, are going to be challenging you in that shortened position. You're not going to be able to get much of a challenge in the lengthened position or um, on free weight movements. Whereas um, machines, yeah, you can do that with the right machines or the right setups, you definitely can. And that's a huge opportunity for growth um, that's, yeah, more unique to machines that you don't necessarily need for the other body parts um, because, yeah, just trying to think now off the top of my head, yeah, every other, just about every other body part might be forgetting one, but just about every other body part with free weights only or maybe cables, you can easily hit the lengthened position and the shortened position, all positions, um, and overload them. But back's a bit harder, and you have less variety without machines. Yeah, with I, when I was thinking about this, it was something where if I looked at chest, it's we can get lengthened with no machine, but it may be difficult for us to get fully shortened. We could do things with bands or something of that nature, but yeah. chest is is kind of split. And so I, I agree that with back, it's really the only one where we're being more dependent on the machines to provide the chest support. Um, and especially with what with you talked about CASM and the further uh, research that they're doing at N1, and I'm sure other places are, are digging into this as well with more of the, the pull around variations. I'm curious of how we can provide chest support in that setting to even further um, chase the, the lengthened position of the lat. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think what he's doing over there and like some of these movements that he's um, bringing to the 
to the table are super interesting. Yes, very interesting. Now, one thing that I think is so cool and someone I've, I've looked up to all of my time in the fitness industry, someone that you had a, as a mentor and someone that you were able to, um, have camps with and other things as well. Like so much content that you were able to do is with, uh, John Meadows. I think he's an instrumental part to the fitness industry. Uh, someone who has an impact that is just continuing to have impact uh, across the decades with John he was an, an incredible human. What were some of the things that you were able to take from your relationship with him that you're still able to apply within your training now? Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot. And to be honest, like the biggest lessons from John will always be non-training and gym related. It'll always be, um, like I remember when I first brought him out and I was like deep into bodybuilding. It's all I cared about was getting as jacked as possible. And we had a seminar out here in Melbourne and he was talking about his family a lot. He's talking about how he always has family day and he didn't always have that. You know, he had to have his wife pull him up on that and be like, hey, just because you're two weeks out and you're literally knocking on death's door right now, you still got to take the kids to school. Like, I don't give a fuck. Like, I'm not a competitor. Like, I'm a mum, and you've got to take care of the kids. And he's like, shit, you know what? You're right. <laughs> <laughs> um, where, where Mary, she never let him cut him any slack. Where he wanted, like he wanted to be the bodybuilder, like, hey, just leave me alone. I'm two weeks out. I'm one week out. You know, I'm dehydrated and just depleted. I just gotta have my me time. And she's like, yeah, good for you, but we still got a we still got a household to run. You still got duties. You still have things that you got to do. Um, and a lot of stories he would tell about from his own perspective or the clients that he worked with, where a lot of them were making, you know, what can be considered depending on, on how you feel about these kinds of things. Um, probably negative life choices around how they handle those relationships, um, friendships, all in the pursuit of just pure body, bodybuilding or not even bodybuilding, but just the gym. Um, and it's like, that's not cool, man. Like it sounds hardcore, but it's just not cool. And it's kind of glorified, but it's, um, it's glorified to become this bodybuilding monk or this muscle building monk who just goes ghost mode for a while and just transforms their life and comes out better for us. Like, no, that really happens. That really happens. It usually is because you're you're going ghost mode because you got some shit you got to work through and you don't end up working through it. You just take a bunch of trend and become an even worse version of yourself at the end of it. But you're just more jacked. Um, but anyway, back on track <laughs> with the training side. Um, the biggest thing from John with training was to really continue to be open minded um, and very analytical and always be you know experimenting as much as you can. It's one thing that John never lost sight of, no matter how big he already was and how much more he was improving and doing what he was doing is improving, he was still trying to find ways that were um, going to help him. And he would experiment as much as he could. And I don't like using the word like forever student, but he was really exploring as much as he could um, just to try to make himself better. Whereas I think now, well, even back then, I don't say now as like, oh, kids these days, it's kids those days as well. Um, people will find different things to latch onto and see this is the answer. RTS is the answer. N1 is the answer. Eugene is the answer. Alex Bush is the answer. It's like, well, that's not the case. Like we're all, it should always be a continued developing and evolving um, model that you use on how you look at the body and how you apply it where the principles may be the same. You know, like I talk about moving fast and slow, stable, unstable, they're the principles. But the way that you apply it to the individual, um, that, may, that may change. Um, and I think that's what John was really, really big on. He was huge on taking a principles-focused approach with training and being very um, open-minded and willing to experiment and explore. And that's why you can see in his training programs, even now if you had purchased all his training programs, you'll see from his first programs up to his very last ones, there's such huge change in how he would program. Doesn't mean that program one was worse and program 25 was the absolute best. Um, it's just that they just chose evolution in how he's applying things. And they can all give you different, um, give you fantastic results um, based on how you apply it to yourself. Are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s, able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. 
We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program because you are awesome and I want you to have this program. I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. Now with with his ability to learn, and that's one of the things that I've tried to pick up from him, how are you applying that now with, we can say back training or just really anything within health and wellness that you are working to learn more about at this time? Yeah, um, it really is just about, um, well, for, for me personally, I'll, I'll look and say I'm always trying to challenge what I'm currently doing. I'm always trying to, um, I'm not looking to confirm what I already know. I'm trying to say, here's what I know. Where could it be wrong? Where could it be made better? Not even that it's wrong, but like maybe it's completely 99.99% right with that much certainty. But could it be done even better? And is it something that we haven't explored just yet that could make it that little bit better? And better not being the objective, this study shows 17% more growth from this exercise, but better being maybe is there a better application for this? Maybe there's a way to make this more enjoyable. Maybe there's a way to make it just a little bit easier to do. Like, okay, so here's an example. Kasim does his um, press arounds or his pull arounds. Um, great movements. Um, I used to lay sideways on a preacher bench and I would do a, with a dumbbell, a crossbody press. <laughs> Fucking dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> I used to um, imagine a, a side plank right? Uh, but instead of doing a side plank, I was where your arms on the ground. My other arm was hanging off a Smith machine. So my body was still in the same side plank position. So I could then do the same cross body press. Fucking dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. You know, the, the principle was there. Shorten position chest, allow some protraction, get the arm moving across the body to shorten that muscle. I'll do the opposite thing for back as well, trying to row sideways across the body by, by literally lying sideways on a bench so I can pull my arm across my body. Um, fucking dumb. <laughs> you know? like, like, don't do that shit. Um, and it's just saying, okay, you, just because it worked great, honestly. Like I got the best pumps from that. I was growing a lot of muscle from that. Um, it felt awesome. I really enjoyed it doesn't mean I would advise it now. It doesn't mean that even back then it was the best thing I was doing. It doesn't mean that I would say like, that's what you should do. I was trying to find ways to make it even better and say, okay, um, how can this be, yeah, maybe made, made, made more enjoyable or more practical for people? Um, those kinds of conversations. <laughs> were, were you putting that in programs that you were selling at that time? Um, I wasn't selling programs oh. back then, so no. But if I was, 100% I would have. 100% I would have. Yeah. Yeah. I would have been like, yeah, this is a great movement. Uh, but this is like back deep in bodybuilding days before I was really doing much to the masses programming. It was all just personal coaching. But yeah, for my clients right. in person at the gym, it's like, hey guys, let's let's hang off this bar and do this cross body press thing. Or let's lay side sideways on this bench and do a cross body row. Um, I don't know why that came to me as like the most logical exercise as opposed to grabbing a cable and just pulling it across the body. <laughs> it took me a while to get there, but I got there. Do you remember where it started from of what gave you the idea of, ooh, I could try it this way and this may feel better? Yeah. So literally, um, yeah, the first one was the, I'd be on one of those sit-up benches, those decline benches. And I was, I used to do, um, side lateral raises laying like that, which is completely fine. That's a great exercise to do, like, like an, a, a lie, side lying inclined lateral raise over like that lengthened position. And I was literally reaching forwards to grab the dumbbell off the ground. Mm. And I was like, oh, this is really nice for my back. And I'm very stable. I'm very fixed. So it ticks the box. It's stable. It's taking the muscle through long range of motion. It's going into a different range of different position I'm not used to. This is awesome. Um, so I just started doing it. I didn't bother to think, what about a cable? <laughs> <laughs> That is so funny. Maybe another year or so to be like, oh, yeah. And then I started doing cross-body cable rows um, <laughs> back then as well. I was like, oh, this is great. And then I, and then I slowly discarded the dumbbell variation. Um, it was literally shit like that. Yeah. Where I'd, I'd stumble across these movements um, sort of by accident and then be like, oh, this could work really well. And then 
and then I'd run with it for a while and then realize, okay, maybe it could be a little bit better. Um, but a lot of the time it's like that. Like people used to ask me like, Eugene, do you just sit here in your gym or back when I was not work having a gym, but in any gym because I was working in gyms. Like, do you just sit there and just sort of think of movements? I said, no, I don't. Like, I'm not, I'm not a, like, I feel like that's what like, Cassim might do, which is not a knock. It's like, I think that's fucking cool. Just sit here and be like, how can I hit this lat fiber even better? What would make the most sense? And then just work it out. I think that's cool. I don't do that. Um, I'll just be training and be like, oh, that felt nice. What, how can I make sense of this? Um, and back then it was a lot stupider than it is now. <laughs> yeah, but less knowledge back then. And I was like, you know, 10, 15 years ago, different times. Um, but yeah. That's what I was going to ask you is that with your personal gym, cause I training here at the house, we have a decent bit of equipment and I'll just go out there and kind of look at movements and see if I can change my body positioning in a certain way to hit the muscle in a different length or something along those lines, just to have some fun and to give my brain a, a little bit of a jog of creativity, if you will. Um, so you're saying that you, you don't do that very often, or it's like in the mix of training, you, you get kind of a, a spurt of, of creativity. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be more so within the context of already training or maybe warming up. Um, there are times like it won't happen every workout, but probably a couple of workouts, whoops, a couple of workouts a week. I, um, I would have some kind of exploration where I'd be like spending five, 10 minutes as part of my warm up. I was like, okay, I want to warm up my shoulders in some way. What, what do I feel like playing with today? And just do something. Um, and there may be a bit of thought process behind it, but I try to keep it as loose as possible and just sort of let my body, you know, not to sound all hippie and esoteric, but just sort of let it get into some kind of flow state and just just fuck around um, and just, just move shit. Um, and, you know, nine times out of ten, it's complete garbage. Um, but sometimes you're like, this is not too bad. Um, this feels pretty good. And then you, you, st- you run with that and – and see where it takes you. But I think that's, you know, if we were to go back on a more, like to answer one of your first questions about what's kind of missing from training, it's definitely that experimentation and just that that thirst for almost like, like improv, um, where a big part of a lot, like training itself should be seen as a creative art of some sort, like going to the gym, like, yes, we have principles and exercises and rules to abide by and to get the best results possible. But people forget that literally everything that we do in the gym or for exercise itself, it's all made up. It is all completely made up by someone who was thinking creatively hundreds of years ago and invented a barbell. Or back in the 1920s when a squat rack was finally invented. Because before that, people were doing Steinborn lifts to get the barbell onto their back. It wasn't until Steinborn invented a squat rack. Um, And I think there should be some time and space carved out for just free flowing experimentation and improvisation in the gym to sort of see and find different things that may work a little bit better. Although just like most improv experimentation, most of it's going to be complete garbage. Right. (laughs) We've got to accept that as well. Um, And this is not an excuse to just completely discard our sound principles because our sound principles knowledge, rules around training, exercise science, they should be guiding and they should be at the back of our subconscious at all times. But we should also be open-minded and say, yeah, let's just fuck around a little bit and just see what feels good, what doesn't feel good, um, and try to just find new things to train the body because the body is so adaptive and we need to find ways to push it for that adaptation beyond pure muscle building. Absolutely. And again, I appreciate you coming on today and I want to be very respectful of your time. And as we're coming up on, on the end of this episode, could you let the listeners know if, if there was one to maybe three things that they can take away from this episode that they can apply to their back training, what would that be? Um, first one, I guess we've spoken a lot about is movement optimization. Um, but I guess not even that, I want to bring it back to so that the more, more the principle of, um, anti-fragility which is what movement optimization is based on. And it's something that people think, oh, anti-fragile just means that we're very strong, capable, and adaptive. It's like, well, that's that's not enough. See, fragility means that you apply stress to something and it breaks, which means like we're very fragile. Anti-fragile doesn't mean that you're very strong. Anti-fragile, to steal from um, the economist Nassim Taleb, who, Taleb, I'm probably butchering his name, who coined the term anti-fragility, it's an organism or a structure or a thing that thrives from being thrown into stresses. That's what we are. Where 
we're not fragile or very brittle and can be broken from spinal flexion or exploring different exercises and movements and different types of types of stressors that be seen as dangerous the body will actually thrive from being thrown into those situations um where something very explosive and snappy like even like a keeping pull up or whatever it can be a very very useful thing to train your joints to train your muscles to teach them how to be very reactive and explosive that we don't get from muscle building um so i think that's like probably the biggest thing is just the concept of anti-fragility but then the applications of it more so being let your body do a lot more than you think it it should be doing <laughs> from a muscle building perspective because just because something may not be the most optimal thing for muscle building doesn't mean that it can't enhance your muscle building endeavors also noting the fact and we didn't touch on this really much is that um, as much as a lot of people really like to obsess about muscle building and trying to find the optimal thing to build muscle, is that really your goal? And if you really ask 99% of people who can end up consuming this information, it probably isn't. You know, out of the people who consume and who follow you and engage with your content, you're going to have um, a lot of trainers, a lot of coaches, a lot of educated people. Do those people give a shit about being Mr. Olympia and pack on as much muscle as possible? They, they fucking don't. They think they do, but they don't. And the clients they work with, do they care? No. Do the gen pop people, the enthusiasts, the lifting enthusiasts who are very advanced, do they care about building as much muscle as possible? They actually don't because if they did, they'd be using all, all kinds of trend and steroids and trying to be Mr. Olympia. They just they want to build some muscle mass. But what do we really want? We want to be improving our capacity as humans. We want to be improving our as many qualities as we can, including muscle mass. And maybe biasing muscle mass more because it's fun to look a certain way. Um, but at the end of the day, our big thing that we're chasing after, oh, well, that I'm chasing, I don't want to say everyone, but I think a lot, big thing that a lot of people are chasing after really is improving their capacity as a human. Um, that definitely can be biased more towards muscle mass. Um, but part of that should be, you know, can you move well? Are you strong? Are you mobile? Are you athletic? Do you have all these qualities and not just the size? Because you definitely can't take the size thing too far, um, not because you're going to get more muscle bound, but because by pursuing pure muscle building, you're going to eventually neglect other areas that are really important to human body. Oh, yeah. I, I could not agree more. And I, I feel as though that at my point, at the point I am in my own journey, I feel like I have reached a point at I've added the more muscle tissue and I've taken away from my overall function. And now I'm trying to get back to a more functional state and I'm just going to feel better in general. So I'm sure that many of the listeners will, will agree with that. Yeah, totally. Thank you guys so much for listening. Eugene, thank you again for being on. Could you let everyone know where to find you um, and to just engage with you more? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate your time as well. Uh, people can find me on Instagram and YouTube. Just search my name and I'll pop up and you'll be able to follow my content there. I do have an app available as well where you can get access to my programs and a little coach that I work with as well. Uh, that's called Gambaru Method. Um, there'll be a link somewhere, I'm sure, or some kind of at somewhere people to find that and uh yeah i really appreciate the time awesome thank you guys for listening and we'll see you guys in the next episode